I know people that are extremely successful at startups uh, that are billionaires. I know people that have had moderate successes. Um, you know, I've, I've been in startups for the last decade, so I've met quite a lot of people. And I think I think one of the things that um, maybe the general public isn't that aware of is a lot of folks that are, are that are billionaires that make it really big actually had minor successes before or have come from families that are actually quite well off. My name is Kevin David, and if you want real financial freedom for yourselves and for your loved ones today, then the time is now. And I will be there to help you every step of the way. What is up, guys, and welcome back to another exciting episode of The Kevin David Experience, your favorite podcast or soon-to-be favorite podcast. Today we have a very special guest joining us, but very quick, I wanted to give a big shout out to all of you guys who are leaving us reviews on iTunes and leaving comments and engaging on the YouTube channel where we just actually started launching full episodes and also KDE clips. And so today we have Jerry uh, Shannon joining us from Puerto Rico. Um, and so Jerry, the first question that we ask everybody on the podcast is to describe your entrepreneurial journey all the way up until right now in 60 seconds or less. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, so I, I started my entrepreneurial journey about a decade ago. Um, I actually created the first fantasy football app for mobile phones. This is back when the iPhone and Androids are still brand spanking new. I uh, didn't really know what I was doing, but somehow got that acquired by Yahoo and it became Yahoo Fantasy Football. So it's kind of cool to have an app out there that people have heard of. Uh, ever since then, been doing startups with the same crew. Um, and now I am the co-founder of Welcome, and we help companies put on virtual events, which is a big thing now, uh, now with COVID. So that's, that's where awesome. So <clears throat> today. were you, were you excited when you saw like the DraftKings type companies come out? Cause that, that happened quite a long time after you founded yours, right? Yeah. I mean, it was really interesting. That was a, a fascinating time to be in fantasy sports just because the, all the legal stuff was sort of gray. Um, one of my biggest projects once I joined Yahoo was actually bringing that sort of daily fantasy style games uh, uh, to the Yahoo platform. So yeah, it was an exciting time. Now DraftKings is, uh, is a huge company. So it's I'm pretty stoked to, to see him succeed there. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. What do, you, what do you think the difference is between um, you know, a company that goes on to become like a big public company like that or something that, you know, might get acquired like earlier on. Did, did you ever like think back about, you know, watching DraftKings kind of turn into what it became and and think, uh, you know, what the difference was? That's a really good question. I mean, a lot of it, I think, is out of your control as an entrepreneur, right? Like a lot of things have to go right, especially with something like DraftKings, FanDuel, um, the biggest risk there was legal, right? And like nobody knew whether or not they would get legalized. And, and now certainly all the laws have gone in their favor, especially with all the sports gambling laws and, and things like that. So at the end of the day, when I think about the difference between uh, what I did and what they did, they just took a much bigger risk than I did, right? right? Yeah. Uh, I, I made a mobile app for fantasy sports. Uh, it was a pretty obvious idea, at least to me at the time. Right. But I always knew the, the upside wasn't going to be quite as high, but that was OK. I mean, that was my first experience starting a company, mm -hmm. uh, learned a lot. But this time around, I'm really swinging for the fences. Yeah. And, and it's interesting, too, because I was I was talking to another uh, guest recently and like we were kind of talking about like what the difference is between like a millionaire or like a multimillionaire and a billionaire. And, and kind of what we settled on and what I thought, you know, what I think is interesting is generally the people that go on to become billionaires. And I'm not saying, you know, everyone should try to become a billionaire. It's certainly not for everyone. But the difference that we were kind of uh, agreed on <clears throat> was that billionaires go like all in on themselves, like they like just full risk, 100 percent. Like, you know, Elon Musk has that famous thing where he had to borrow money for rent because he spent all of his money on, you know, Tesla and SpaceX that he made from his, his previous acquisition. And so, like, what, what is your opinion uh, on, you know, taking uh, taking risk that extreme? Um, do you think that it's ever worth it? Are you doing it now versus, you know, kind of taking a more reasonable approach, so to speak? Oh, man, I could talk about this for a long time. I, I, I've thought about this for quite uh, quite a while, actually. Um, you know, I, I know people that are extremely successful at startups uh, that are billionaires. I know people that have had moderate successes. 
you know, I've, I've been in startups for the last decade, so I've met quite a lot of people. And I think, I think one of the things that um, maybe the general public isn't that aware of is a lot of folks that are, are, that are billionaires that make it really big actually had minor successes before or have come from families that are actually quite well off, right? So you have a good launching pad where you can afford to take more risk. Now, if you're, you know, somebody that comes from absolutely nothing, it's really tough to take that type of financial risk that can have those sort of outsized returns. Um, so I think it's really dependent on your life situation. Like for me, I didn't have that, you know, I didn't have that trust fund or I didn't, I didn't have that, uh, uh, that, that background of having another exit to kind of lean back on. So I wasn't really able to make that type of uh, risky move at that point in my life. Now that I have an exit under my belt, um, you know, I'm not like set for life or anything, but I'm, I'm doing okay. I can afford to take uh, more risk with my next move, right? So I think it's very life dependent. Um, but I do agree in general that if the the bigger risk that you take, the the more reward there could potentially be for sure. Yeah, and when and we when we talk about like taking risk, what what do you think that that actually like means? Like that they're literally taking more money of their their own money and investing it into their venture. To me, in the context of startups, um, it's interesting because a for a startup to succeed, it kind of has to seem like a bad idea, right? And what I mean by that is, if it's an obvious idea to everyone a lot of people would do it, right? But if you look at a lot of the success stories, like an Airbnb or an Uber or a Coinbase, when they first started, a lot of people thought they were terrible ideas. I mean, there's a famous story of, of uh, Brian Chesky from Airbnb uh, going to tons of investors and getting laughed out of the room, right? Like, who would want to rent a, a room from a random stranger? It just seemed like the craziest idea at the time. Uh, so to me, a risk is being able to follow your conviction, even in the face of ridicule, right? Um, and I think a lot of the, the biggest companies looking back weren't obvious ideas at the time. Um, right. And it takes, a, I think it takes a lot uh, to be able to do that. And so for, for your current uh, venture, right, Welcome, you, you guys are, um, you, you do virtual events, right? And then, you know, there are other competitors out there that, you know, have raised like an ungodly amount of money, like hop in yeah. and, you know, I think they raised $600 million or something like insane. Like what, what is your, uh, what is your opinion on, on that? Right. Cause I mean, you know, to play devil's advocate, you might say that, you know, a lot of people have that kind of virtual event idea right after, you know, us talking about a non-obvious idea. And maybe you guys started before that, or, or maybe, you know, there's enough of a differentiator. Um, but like, what's, what's your opinion on, you know, the other people in the space and having raised, you know, almost a billion dollars and things like that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly a, a tough competitor, right? Because they have such a large war chest. I mean, speaking of Hopin in particular, um, but you know, I've I've kind of seen this story play out many times. There's like a new market. There's a lot of people that get uh, that get funding. And the interesting thing is, the first mover or the 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 first company that receives a lion's share of the funding isn't always the winner, right? So I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, my cousin is the co-founder and CEO of Caviar. So back in the early days of food delivery, you had Caviar, DoorDash, you had Uber Eats, you had Postmates. And uh, it turns out that DoorDash, who was the last mover in that space, they ended up winning, right? They just IPO'd at a, at a huge amount. Um, back in those days, I think Caviar and Postmates, Uber Eats, they were getting the, like, the lion's share of the investment. And people kind of forgot about them, right? But I think what they did really well was that they focused, they executed really rapidly on their strategy, and they eventually won out. You mentioned DraftKings. That's another good example, right? They were actually pretty late to the game. Uh, I think they started maybe four or five years after FanDuel, who sort of invented that daily fantasy space, but they just executed better, and ultimately they were able to win out, right? So right. I think in terms of virtual events, we're still in the early days of the race. Um, you know, Hopin is, uh, is a very uh, formidable competitor, but at the same time, I think it, it's, it's going to be a while for us to see how the market sort of shakes out, right? There's, it's a completely yeah. new market, completely new space. 
um, and the first mover doesn't always win. Yep. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I agree with that. And I'm, we've seen that so many different times. Um, and so you mentioned your cousin is uh, a part of Caviar. Um, do you think that, that entrepreneur, uh, like entrepreneurialism is a genetic thing? Or do you think it's learned? Do you think that, you know, it's common in your family because, you know, you did it or, or you know, someone before you did it? How, how do you think that that actually happens? That's a good question. I don't think it's genetic, but I do think that who you hang around with influences your decision whether or not to become an entrepreneur, right? Um, for me personally, when I first started, uh, I mean, I was in Silicon Valley, first of all. So there was just a lot of people that wanted to do startups. It was seen as a normal thing. Whereas um, if you look at, say, Columbus, Ohio, which is where I grew up, right? That wasn't really that common. Um, so the, I, I guess the social consequences of quitting a you know, well-paying, stable job and doing your own company was just a lot less in Silicon Valley. And that's changing now, which is great, right? Because now, especially with COVID, you have companies springing up everywhere, uh, not just in tech hubs like Silicon Valley or New York. And I think long term, that's great for entrepreneurship, that that's great for diversity. Right, you don't have to necessarily move to one area of the country uh, to do a startup, um, but I think it's it, it is largely dependent on the uh, the people that you, you hang around um, and your family, right, and and just the the culture that uh, that you grow up in. Right, and so for for welcome, you guys raised I, I believe twelve million dollars. If I'm not wrong, is that yeah, is that right? right. So can you talk us through kind of the, the timeline of that? Because, I mean, we have a lot of people who listen, um, you know, who, who maybe want to start their company, who would, you know, maybe have like an idea or something like that. Like, how did that progress? Did you guys already have like a, an MVP, like a, a product built? Um, did you already have paying customers? Like, what was the, the kind of timeline of how that played out? Yeah, so we started um, on the idea last April. So I, I actually just looked recently, it was because it was the one year anniversary of this, but our first line of code was written on April 7th, 2020, right? <laughs> I love that. And, uh, you know, one of the things early on was like, look, we need, to, we need to set a launch date because if we don't set a launch date, we could work on this forever. Because right. once you get into a project, like you want to add this feature or that feature, and that was something we learned from just doing tons of startups and never really launching, right? So we set a hard date, we said, okay, in mid July, we're going to launch this thing and whatever we don't get done until then, like it, it's totally fine. Um, so we launched in mid July, we had a few early customers and the traction for the product was just incredible from, from day one. Uh, we had so many people that wanted to use it just because it was really different than what was out there on the market. And the reason we were able to raise that much money early on, uh, and essentially skip the seed round and go straight to a series A was because of our early traction, right? And investors look at a bunch of things, but the biggest thing that they look at is traction because for them, if they can see a little bit of traction, they can sort of extrapolate <laughs> that out uh, to a large value. Uh, right. But minus the traction, like having an MVP definitely helps, a product that investors can can actually get their hands on. Uh, you know, one, one thing that, came to our advantage um, during COVID too, was everybody was doing these investor meetings on Zoom, right? Back in the day, you would have to go to Sand Hill Road, you drive there, go into these big fancy offices for these VCs, right? And you're, you're totally on their turf, right? And they know it, they, they, uh, they're they able to take advantage of that. Uh, and so for us, we flipped it. We're like, look, we have an amazing video platform. So why don't we take investors from Zoom onto Welcome and essentially have a home court advantage there, right? And so that was a, that was a big part of our of our fundraising strategy too, was to get them onto the product. But because they're in these Zoom meetings all day, we can literally show them what the difference feels like on Welcome. Um, and I mean, they were they were just psyched about being able to get their hands on on a different experience. Because Zoom I love that really. too. It, that's so smart because like, you know, the, I think a, to a to a lay person or to someone who hasn't used, you know, that type of uh, product, you know, I think an obvious question would be like, what's the difference between just like Zoom and like a virtual meeting um, sort of sort of platform. And so actually having it on the platform is, is such a smart idea. You talked about traction, though. 
what what is like in, in a very microscopic way, right? And I, I I know it's probably different for each product, but like what is traction? Like what specific things are investors looking for um, that like a beginning entrepreneur might be able to try to optimize for? Yeah, I mean, uh, it so it really depends on the type of business that you're running, right? If you're a B two C startup, they're probably looking for user growth. All right, so one of the things that they teach you when you go into Y Combinator, uh, which is accelerated that we did, was you want to make sure that you set your metric and that you figure out ways to grow it consistently week over week. All right, and and uh, so if you can grow at 10% per week, you can start off with a very small user base, but showing that traction and that growth is going to be what allows investors to sort of see this becoming a really, really big idea. Because at, right. at the end, end of the day, the biggest difference between a startup and just a small business is your growth rate. That's it, right? If you're fast growing, you're a startup, you're investable. Uh, if you're growing at sort of a linear pace, you're really not. Um, so users, that's a big one for uh, B2B startups like ours, um, revenue, right? Uh, whether it's annual recurring revenue or the amount of contracts that you have, uh, if you're not making revenue, then maybe the amount of uh, pilots that you have, something to show that there's a, there's a demand for your product. Obviously the best is, is revenue. Um, for us, we're pretty audacious because we charge a lot of money up front, right? And, and one of the reasons we were able to do that, I think, is because nobody really knew what a good virtual event experience was. And because it's a new market, we we're able to say, look, this is our, idea of a great virtual event. We think they should look less like Zoom meetings and more like a heavily produced television show. And we'll give you the tools to be able to do that. So it looks like your virtual events on CNN, right? And that really struck a chord with the businesses that we were talking to. Um, and they were willing to pay a lot of money for our product right out the gate. Right. And, what, and I love that. So one, one thing that I'm, I'm curious about, right? Because I mean, when you have like the you know, David versus Goliath sort of thing. And maybe it's not like that, but you know, Hoppins raised so much money that they're obviously like, so uh, they're a daunting competitor. How tempting is it to like, look at what they're doing and integrate that into what you're doing versus like, you know, cause it would probably be naive to ignore them, but like, is it tempting to kind of, you know, say, oh, well, Hoppin is doing this. So maybe we should do the same thing versus like being entirely, you know, yourselves and, and innovative, like how, how much does that play, if at all, how much does that play into kind of your experience? I think it's um, a very dangerous trap to fall into, to care too much about your competitors. And that's because the majority of startups don't actually get killed by competitors. They get killed by, uh, you know, it's a common quote, they're killed by suicide, not homicide, right? Um, and I think the reason is because the biggest advantage you have at a startup is speed. So if you're trying to catch up to where somebody already is, it's always going to be a losing proposition because you don't know the insights that they use to get to that end point, right? Yeah. And with, with, especially with a competitor like Hoppin, which is another startup, right? They're, they're skating somewhere else. So it's sort of pointless to see what they're doing and, and try to copy it. Um, one, one thing that's interesting with, with a competitor like Hopin too, is they're more like a big company than a startup at this point, just because they've gr grown so fast and they're so big, yeah. right? And I've worked at large companies, I've done startups. The difference in speed between a large company and a startup is several orders of magnitude. I mean, it's crazy. And so for us, the key to our success really is to be able to have a vision of the future and to move as quickly as we can toward that future. Um, I mean, it doesn't mean we can't take inspiration from other companies that are in the space, but you know, by and large, I think we have a unique take uh, on the virtual event market. Um, yeah. And it's not really something that our competitors are trying to do. And they could be right, you know, but at, at, the, at the end of the day, um, we think that, that we have a chance to really win the space. So. And uh, so to answer, one, not, not too one, much. We don't, we don't talk to our, about our competitors that much. Yeah, no, I think that, I think that that's great. I, I, I am curious though. One of the last questions I'll, I'll ask before we, we end the podcast for today, ha, like, so Henry Ford has a, a famous quote and he said, you know, if you asked your customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Right. And so like, but the other side of that coin is 
you know, you have to talk to your customers to, to see what they want, like from your product, right? So how important is it to talk to customers to kind of get insight about what they want out of a product versus like, you know, kind of giving them things they may not already, they may not know they even want yet. Yeah. So I think this really depends on the phase of product development um, that you're currently in. When we were first conceiving the idea of welcome, right? We didn't have a product yet. So what we did was, because our CEO is a really great designer, we took all of the input from the customers that we were talking to, and we created this really high fidelity prototype in a design tool called Figma. And we literally showed it to them. We said, look, this is what we're thinking about building. What do you think? Right? So we literally showed, to use your analogy, we showed them that car. Um, and they were able to give us feedback on that. Now that we have a product and it's in the market, we can't all of a sudden say, hey, what do you want? We'll create a completely new product for you, right? It doesn't really work that way. So it's a, a lot more iterative at our stage. But that zero to one stage, as you described it, is the funnest for me because it's a, it's a blue ocean, right? It, literally, the product could be anything. And the real skill, I think, in being an entrepreneur is to do exactly what you mentioned, is to take the customer pain points and create a solution around that that's not necessarily based on something that other people are doing, uh, but based on your creativity, right? And that's exactly what we did. We heard our customers wanted better production value, they wanted more engagement, and we're like, huh, I wonder what would it, it would be like if virtual events felt like TV shows. I love right? that. And, and, and at that point, like, no, nobody really created something like that, so we were able to start from scratch and create a product that, you know, to this day, and nobody else has managed to duplicate. I love it. So the last question I'll ask you is, if you could go back in time and talk to 18-year-old Jerry, but you only had enough time to tell him one thing, what would you say to him? Take more risk in your 20s. Buy Bitcoin. <laughs> and buy Bitcoin, yeah. <laughs> uh, I love it, man. Well, thank you so much for, for coming on. Um, if people want to learn more uh, about you and, and welcome or the things you do, or if you enjoy having people reach out, uh, what's, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, so feel free to go to our website, experiencewelcome.com. Uh, you can book a demo if you're interested in checking it out. Uh, we have plenty of resources there on how to throw great virtual events, um, and that's the best way to reach out to us. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Jerry. We really appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks for having me, Kevin. Cool. Thanks, man. I appreciate it.